All right. Uh, welcome everyone to our online lecture series. Uh, we are Type Electives. We are an online design school uh, shaping the future of type, uh, co-founded by my co-director Lin Yu, who's also who's here, and myself, Juan Villanueva. Uh, we try to offer courses that go beyond the traditional type design education offerings. Uh, what that means is that we offer a wide range of life uh, online classes that are focused on letter forms, which include type design, lettering, and creative technology. And we try our best to work with a faculty that is made up of people who approach their practice from a place of respect, responsibility, criticality, and of course, love. So we're excited also to work with students that are interested in exploring future that is founded in these principles. Um, this is part of a lecture series. This is our last uh, talk of this series. Uh, we've had three before from Joe Malini's talking about uh, the type design scene and her context coming from the Philippines. Liam Beery, who talk about uh, his design practice working at a creative agency. And if you are, once you get inspired about design concepts of design thinking, watch his talk. And then the last one was Kel Trafton uh, two weeks ago. And he talked about his foundry and collaboration with the people that he he has been uh, teaching and also collaborating with in, in the same locality. So definitely check them out. Those are all on our website. And today we have Dina and her talk will be also available later on. So just keep an eye on that. And with that, I'll pass it on to Lynn, who will talk about our upcoming events. Yes, we have an exciting uh, event coming up in, uh, in Greenwood Cemetery with Raven Mo. And so walking through the cemetery, Raven is going to uh, point out a lot of amazing examples of type design and lettering, like exploring an outdoor museum. It's the place with some of the city's most remarkable letterings and stone carvings, of course. So if you are free on November 4th, which is a Saturday, uh, please join us at Greenwood Cemetery for this lettering walk with Raven. There's only six spots left, so if you want to come, better sign up soon. Yes, and there's our uh, our spring lineup for 2024. It's a little bit wild that we're, uh, you know, already planning for the spring, but it's, you know, it's coming up. We've made a full circle um, for type electives. If you, for those of you who know, we started in January of this year, so it's kind of uh, wild to see one full seasonal cycle come through. But if you're interested, uh, subscribe to our newsletter, and then that's how you can keep up to date with our new offerings and classes. Yeah, lots of exciting things happening uh, for next year. We are we can't wait. Um, oops, sorry, I think I stopped sharing. Let me let me share again. No worries. Oops. Technical difficulties. Happens all the time. Okay, here you go. Thank you, thank you. And we are super duper excited to have Dina with us today. Dina Bendrahim is a Moroccan multidisciplinary creative educator, organizer, and researcher who uses an intersectional feminist lens to dissent and investigate design for visibility, civic action, and social justice with minoritized communities to collectively reimagine equitable futures. Dina is currently an endowed assistant professor of graphic design at the University of Arkansas and the founder and director of Hello Departures, an ever evolving experimental program at the intersection of design pedagogy, strategy and community that provokes uplifting transformative possibilities. All the amazing things that we are super duper excited to hear from today. Thank you so much, Dina. Please take it away from us. Thank you for introducing me. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, first of all, thank you for pronouncing my name right. I feel like I haven't heard it in such a long time properly, uh, you know, um, said. So thank you. And thank you to both of you, Juan and Lin, for inviting me today. Um, I'm just really excited to share this space with you all. And also, um, I've been really inspired by Type Electives. It's really a neat project. And congrats for actually putting this work out there um, and having it as successful as it is today. Um, so I will share uh, with you all a couple of, um, 
ideas and experiments um, and projects that I've been engaged with. Uh, but before we do that, um, I would like to introduce um, the nuances behind my identity so that you understand why I am committed to doing the kind of work that I do. Um, this is Tangier, Morocco. It's where I was uh, born and raised. And my ancestors are Iberian, Moroccan, Sephardic Jew, Southwest Asian, Italian, Sierra Leonean, and Nigerian. And, you know, I've had dreams of being a fish for a day job, but it didn't quite work out. So as Lynn said, I am an endowed assistant professor uh, of graphic design today. Um, and this identity is uh, narrowed down to being Arab. Um, I also moved to the United States in 2017, which made me a non-resident alien. Um, and I choose to use the words that US immigration uh, intentionally crafted uh, for folks like me uh, to dehumanize us against my very human photo and ancestry. Um, I identify as a POC Arab woman, but obviously this is a really narrow uh, definition as we know why now. And I'm also a mom of two kiddos, um, and it's important for me to take space as a mother because, you know, we're often invisible, especially in academia, and talking about invisibility uh, behind that baby on the right is my partner, and you can't see him. <laughs> Um, but, you know, my identity has more nuances than these few slides uh, can show, but this is enough for you to understand where I'm coming from and why I do the work that I'm doing. And part of it is that I lived in patriarchal societies from the day I was born until today. And so I found uh, refuge in feminism. Um, I really identify with the words of uh, Sarah Ahmed, who says to live a feminist life is to make everything into something that is questionable. Uh, to me, uh, leaning into the uncomfortable act of questioning everything is really an act of self-preservation and love, love for myself, for others, for the planet. And it's not an academic skill and it's not, you know, something that I do for a checkbox. It's really the lens through which I experience life. And when people ask me who are my favorite designers, honestly, I can't think of one, which is probably a bad idea you know, with this audience. Uh, but I can think of many feminist writers whose literature just fed me so much joy and just, you know, gave me an understanding of life and how to navigate it with um, the intersections of my identity. Um, and it also gave me um, uh, this um, right to exist as my true self and uh, the need for justice. So if you're looking for great reads, highly recommend all of these. Once upon a time, I had an epiphany. I was a copywriter at JWT uh, Casablanca and the state owned uh, TV channel Dezem caused this huge outrage in the show Sabahiyat. Uh, it actually aired a tutorial on how to cover up bruises with makeup. Um, and uh, it was during the International Day uh, Against Violence Against Women. And I just remember being so shocked that this huge um, media could um, uh, like share narratives that are so oppressive like this. And so I remember going to my managing director saying that we absolutely needed to do something that we weren't just in advertising uh, for, you know, the agenda of capitalism. And he said, if you can make it happen with zero dollars, then go for it. Um, and, you know, we did actually, and we did um, a reverse tutorial um, and then it became an insert in print magazines where uh, there was a fake makeup remover that was applied on prints and then it revealed uh, bruises in our message. And our message was essentially that six out of 10 women are victims of domestic violence. And instead of um, hiding it, people should speak up. Um, and let's watch this reverse tutorial that uh, we made. 
Salam alaikum les filles, j'espère que vous allez bien. Alors aujourd'hui on se retrouve pour une nouvelle vidéo. Je vais vous apprendre à vous démaquiller sans vous abîmer la peau. So, um, not only this won multiple awards, uh, but it also sparked debate in the parliament. And at that moment, I just had to click. I was like, I actually need to quit my job and go back to grad school and study design for social justice. This is what I wanted to do at that moment. And it was crystal clear for me. Um, so fast forward uh, a few years later, um, all the work that I do uh, today um, is collaborative and in community. And in many ways, I see myself as an activator of ideas and ideas that wouldn't be meaningful if they weren't um, in collaboration with other folks. And my work also aims to be pluriversal and equitable. And while doing it, I always remain self-reflective about my own position in relation to power. And a practicing design following these uh, principles can involve really complex and raw feelings. Um, and it's also just a huge commitment. Um, so this is a story about um, raw feelings uh, we are in 2019, and the Moroccan uh, journalist Haja Reisouni was accused of having um, sex outside marriage and abortion, and both are crimes in Morocco. And the law also specifies that anyone who produces graphics to promote abortion in any way can be prosecuted. So I was scared <laughs> doing this, uh, but I... I ended up getting involved in it and I designed this very simple identity for what became known as um, the Outlaws campaign. And um, essentially, uh, Leila Slimani and Sonia Tarab, who are uh, writers and filmmakers, uh, wrote a manifesto and I overviewed the English version. And I just wanna say like, this is nothing, you know, crazy in terms of identity. It's super simplistic, but, to me, I wanted to make it as accessible as possible so that it could have been owned by the community. And it's exactly what happened. And what you see on the right here of um, this slide, it was uh, translated by people and people tried to match the typefaces. Um, and um, like you see the example here in Spanish, um, this campaign was in social and print. It was in French, English, and Moroccan, Arabic, and Arabic. And then it got translated in other languages. And then people started sending us, um, you know, stories, and we reposted those stories. And people started, you know, owning the campaign in their own ways and making artwork with, um, with elements from this identity. And it became so viral 
um, and so strong after, you know, being organically just a machine in its own that Hajar Raisuni was actually freed uh, later that month um, after this entire pressure. Um, and then I just want to say that my activism can be proactive, reactive, or simply just ongoing and active. And in this case, I've been more and more curious about uh, Moroccan design history because it just didn't exist in uh, uh, design books. Um, and obviously we know that since most of them are written from a Eurocentric perspective, even if things started to shift right now. Uh, but I've been uh, writing uh, on Moroccan design and I've been invited to, uh, you know, give some talks on Moroccan design history and when I started digging little by little, um, I just really wanted to publish more because of the lack uh, of representation in the canon. And in the book, Feminist uh, Interrupted, Lola Olufemi writes, it is our job as feminists to rediscover the histories that have been purposefully withheld from us because it is the voices that speak to us from the past that help share our vision for the future. And to me, researching and publishing um, stories on Moroccan design is another feminist journey. So in doing so, I actually started working with uh, Amazir women uh, who are indigenous to North Africa. And I started studying uh, their symbology and visual languages that are very much nested in feminism and feminist stories. Um, and I also wanna say that the frame of Eurocentric um, graphic design history that we've been fed is so narrow because it doesn't even uh, conceive craft as worthy of design. And I really think we need to shift that. And when shifting that, then, you know, in indigenous spaces, when we understand craft as design, then it reveals uh, new ways of knowing and learning. And so um, in this context, um, despite centuries of colonization and uh, patriarchy, uh, Amazigh women, uh, you know, were weaving their legacy in everyday life objects like rugs. And so their stories kind of survived throughout all of this, you know, just thanks to them. Um, and then, you know, one thing, one key fact is that throughout the years, different political regimes and um, and philosophies and ideologies were happening throughout, but still, you know, um, their stories remained, but are at great loss or at great risk of being lost because they keep alterating, uh, you know, as days and weeks and months and years go by without them being recorded, you know, in a way that is published. And traditionally it's been published by uh, male ethnographers. So again, the lens has been orientalizing and um, shifting the stories uh, as their original meaning. And I got in contact with the ENU, which is an artisan owned and artisan managed e-commerce platform. It was founded in 2013 with the goal to actually give power back to Amazigh weavers. And we started collecting these design stories and adding them to a taxonomy of symbols that I've been compiling. So if you're interested in this research, I actually published two essays, uh, one in Centered uh, that is edited by Kalina Sells and the other one in Feminist Designer edited by Alison Place. And also you can reach out to me and I can give you um, a PDF, a high-res PDF of uh, the poster you see on the left that has all the symbols with different meanings. And then there is also a lecture in BIPOC design history in the Swana edition called Woven in Feminism, where I do talk about these symbols and go in depth about this research. I wanna shift gears and uh, this is particularly relevant for the next project that I will talk about um, because I'm an educator. This is 2018 and we are at the University of Florida and these are the first cohort of students that I ever taught. 
and they really changed my life. And, you know, we took this photo to remember how special it was to collaborate together and just simply um, challenge power with an intersectional feminist approach using design. And I really fell in love with teaching. Um, they taught me uh, what Bell Hooks wrote, that uh, the classroom remains the most radical space of possibility in the academy. And my journey as a creative actually shifted to incorporate pedagogy in what I do. And what this means uh, with my feminist practice is that it led me to engage pedagogy, which is also a term that was coined by Bell Hooks. Um, I taught a number of classes since 2018. And as an educator, I always embrace horizontality and vulnerability, also honesty and care to encourage students to find agency. And like Bell Hooks taught, um, there is no engaged pedagogy without the deep care of students in terms of well-being, but also in terms of pushing them in ways uh, that are not traditional. Um, and on top of that, um, when empowering them, it cannot happen if us as educators um, don't accept to be vulnerable in that space either. I think this kind of pedagogy and practice can be an activist act in and of itself, especially in really conservative environments and given the intersections of my identity. Hence uh, how this talk has been named. Uh, I want to talk about Bell Hooks again. She wrote, given that our educational institutions are so deeply invested in a banking system, teachers are more rewarded when we do not teach against the grain. The choice to work against the grain, to challenge the status quo, often has negative consequences. And that is part of what makes that choice one that is not politically neutral. Building more equitable futures is not politically neutral. Working in design histories is not politically neutral. Working with engaged pedagogy is not politically neutral. And, you know, talking about not politically neutral, I would like to introduce an important concept here called Conscientes de Sao by Paulo Freire. In this book, Paulo Freire discusses how students are beings for themselves instead of being piggy banks uh, where knowledge is actually deposited. Uh, students can use their critical thinking um, to analyze systemic contradictions and design more equitable collaborative futures uh, for the well being of the planet and people and non humans. Um, and according to Freire, this requires consent to the Sao, which is essentially a transformation of consciousness without which we cannot take action against oppressive realities. And in empowering education, critical teaching for social change, Ira Shaw writes, education is more than facts and skills. It is a socializing experience that helps make the people who make society. As an educator, I really feel that our role is to be facilitators of um, opportunities that can emancipate. And the most rewarding ones to me um, are opportunities that are actionable possibilities grounded in reality. And it's in this context that I actually founded Hello Departures, which is an experimental program at the intersection of design pedagogy, strategy, and community. And my role is in it to um, initiate collaborative projects that facilitate learning and teaching new equitable ways forward, whether in Arkansas or beyond, with students, faculty, and community. And one of the main goals, really, is to promote a diversity of thoughts and practices. And as I practice engaged pedagogy in my classrooms, this became really a foundational um, um, value uh, within Hello Departures, among other values in here. I want to talk about a few more experiments that are within the frame of Hello Departures. This is a project that actually helped me visualize the potential of Hello Departures. It's called the Pine Project. 
so with identity systems, fabrication students, and the Fayetteville Public Library, uh, we reimagined um, the really cold uh, coined um, operated uh, period dispenser. Um, and we replaced it with something more inclusive, more uh, transparent, just kinder really, you know, more accessible uh, for all menstruating folks, um, which means it's not just women uh, and that's accessible to people in our community. And we also made a kit for uh, people who needed more products than what the dispenser could give them or people who wanted to try um, a period cup or a period underwear. Um, and so the the project itself uh, funded more than a year uh, of period products to the Fayetteville Public uh, Library, which included uh, these sustainable menstrual cups, uh, period underwear in inclusive sizes, as well as organic and compostable tampons, liners, and pads. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, the goal was really to contribute to reducing period poverty in the community. And so we reproduced this project in another space called The Medium, which is an art space in Springdale, Arkansas. Um, and we also made uh, anything uh, with the kind project uh, as an open source uh, thing. So anybody who wants to reproduce this project in their community can do so uh, simply by reaching out to us. Um, and then it could also be, you know, like, like if you want to do this in your community and you don't know where to start, it can serve as a base for you to know where to go and how to reproduce something like this. Um, this work was uh, selected to be part of the traveling uh, international uh, exhibit Fight for Kindness 2022 uh, that was uh, done by Type Campus. So it went in Paris, Milan, Valencia, Veliko Tarnovo, and Fitchburg. And it also recently won uh, the AIGA 365 year in design um, in the category social design. But most importantly, we really reached our um, community here uh, and the most vulnerable are actually people of color, immigrants, non-binary folks, and trans people who cannot have access uh, to period products freely. And by the way, at the medium, it's been also installed in the men's bathrooms. And to me, that was a huge win. Um, this is another project initiated within the context of Hello Departures. Um, so uh, U of A graphic design uh, type students uh, that were led by Professor Ryan Sloan and myself uh, worked in collaboration with a local artist, uh, Olivia Trimble. And um, essentially students uh, researched, explored and revived um, type uh, found type in the community. Uh, so um, it was, you know, across uh, Northwest Arkansas in general, but the focus um, was on um, like artifacts uh, from the past that, you know, uh, never ended up um, anywhere. So like we, um, like they, they went to archives, we had a special collection um, trip, uh, they went to see, uh, you know, old artifacts in the community, uh, like ghost type that was about to get erased. Um, and uh, what they did is create an entire typeface based on their found type. And they participated in a series of other uh, creative workshops. Um, and then um, they collaborated in creating positive messaging. Um, so, so they named this project, I Exist in the Future after Hodori Davis uh, who wrote, um, if I'm not imagined in your future, do I exist in it? And we have now two installations under the historic bridge, um, Lafayette Bridge, and then a Sweet City Arts and Supply. And both of them are really emblematic community spaces. Um, one thing that we did not want to do is our direct this project at all, you know, and really just give the freedom to students to do um, what they felt represented the community. 
Um, and last month, we had a lettering workshop with community members uh, to expand this project beyond uh, the setting of a classroom. And so participants created a movable mural uh, installation uh, with the letter forms. And we really encouraged them to uh, this time, instead of looking necessarily in Fayetteville and Northwest Arkansas, to look within, within their cultural heritage um, and uh, draw letter forms forms uh, that represent who they are. Um, I'm in a state that banned uh, critical race theory and where things are politically odd at this moment. And as a woman of color, I do feel really vulnerable in this space. Uh, so I feel like part of the work uh, needs to happen outside the classroom, and that's one of the roles of um, Hello Departures. Um, so, you know, I'm really self-aware of what I say in a classroom, but in a space adjacent to the classroom, it really can be anything. And ideas that are censored in the classroom are now allowed. Um, and I guess I created the Snap Snap Sizzle Library and now archive uh, to, um, you know, not only uh, like push ideas in the canon and include voices that are not traditionally included, uh, but also expose students uh, to ideas that they may not encounter in classrooms anymore. Uh, one thing I've done is that I collaborated with Mas Libritos, which is um, uh, a local uh, Latina owned intersectional feminist uh, bookstore that centers the stories of black indigenous and people of color communities. So I got all the books uh, from this store. And at the same time, I did um, a call uh, for um, submissions so that we would get um, posters and zines and books that are self-published. Uh, that are not, you know, because it's not easy to publish a book, especially in academic and trade publishers. Uh, however, self-publishing can also allow to expand more voices uh, in design. Um, and so we have uh, works today by the Palestinian Od Nasser, uh, uh, educator, Black, um, Black educator Rick Griffith, um, Puja Saxena, who sent us really beautiful zines from India. Uh, we have um, uh, zines uh, by Jalen Harris uh, and really more people who are sending us constantly things that, you know, um, say things that unfortunately cannot necessarily exist in the classroom anymore. Um, and I'm really glad that we received all these submissions. And if you want to submit your own, just email us or contact us on hellodeparchers.org, which is here. Um, also, there is a talk series that was led um, during the summer. And the goal was really similar to, again, like discuss uh, the design canon and what it means to have liberated design education without any oppressive systems. Um, also put together awards uh, for undergraduate and graduate students uh, in the US to pursue uh, design initiatives that also expand the design canon and build an equitable design practice. And I'm currently um, working on co-organizing a design histories retreat uh, to reimagine, you know, this course from a really decolonial perspective using local contexts among many more initiatives that are, you know, just in in the way of being experiments and experimented with. Um, I'd like to end with uh, Audre Lorde's words. Uh, she wrote. To refuse to participate in the shaping of our future is to give up. Each of us must find our work and do it. Uh, as you can see, like all the projects that I talked to you about really changed me as a person. And I, I do think that I just want to be a better human um, in this planet, you know, and design is one of the tools that I use to do so. Um, and I guess my question for you is how are you contributing to building more equitable words? Um, for example, 
what are you doing about the apartheid and genocide of the Palestinians that we are seeing live uh, on the news, in our Instagram um, and social media, just because of a racist, oppressive government and white supremacy? And what does it mean to even decolonize a curriculum when the voices of Palestinians are brutally being erased at the moment as they've been displaced for 75 years now? And you know, I really believe that what's happening in Palestine is an intersectional feminist issue, um, which is heartbreaking. And decolonization is not an abstract concept. And if you don't know where to start, I put together a bunch of resources on Hello Departures uh, that you can visit and actually take meaningful action. Thank you so much for hearing me and please reach out. Thank you so much, Dina. That was that was an amazing talk, very heartfelt and also very honest, which I, I really appreciate. You gave us a lot of things to think about, a lot of very powerful quotes that I wrote down and you know, things <laughs> I'm gonna be thinking about today, tomorrow, and probably every day. Uh, because you know, change is very slow, but um uh, education, I feel the more I learn, the more the things can become a little bit more manageable and we can start seeing a little bit more hope. In certain places to keep up you know the, the fight and the struggle to towards more equity in the world um i don't know if there are questions i don't see any questions uh do you have any any comments lynn um i have i have, I have comments and questions of course but i also want to give you the room to chat um so i pass the mic over to you lynn i mean thank you so 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 much tina like it's so inspiring and it's also um, such like a timely moment that we have that we re-examine like all of these initiatives and ask ourselves like the hard questions. So I really thank you for uh, for putting us here. I think um, for folks, uh, just a reminder that you can put your question in the chat uh, so we can ask them, or you can also put it in the Q and A function as well. Um, in the meantime, uh, Juan, I know you just mentioned that you had a question that you wanted to ask Dina. Maybe you can start there. Oh, and it looks yeah, like of course. A of parts in the chat. So yeah, that. yeah. Just want to like you know highlight two things that you said. I wish I, I thought were very, very um, both lovely, but also very encouraging. Um, they said when you presented your work, you talked about you know like being not only uh, reactive but also proactive and also very active in the sense of like there's never a state of in, not neutrality. It's like there's no calmness uh, except and this is you know pre predetermined by yourself and you make space in which you can relax. So just mixing that idea with this. This other idea that you also mentioned, uh, actionable possibilities grounded in reality, right? I, I feel like a lot of the work you're doing kind of answers your question towards the end. Like, how do you, what's your part in making uh, a more e e equitable space to, to be part of, to work in, uh, to be part of a community? And I guess this question is a little bit on the selfish side because, you know, as, as, as a school, we're also trying to do similar things. So I guess how do you how do you manage all of the stuff you're doing like you know all the intersection of being a teacher being a person of color right being an immigrant you, you showed us all the work you do but in terms of like a personal um, stake right how do you how do you find spaces to to do things and maybe also you know not burn out and I don't know how do, how do you deal with all of that because I feel like a lot of people who are also trying to put their hands in many many buckets and um, are also dealing with this struggle of you know there's only so much I can do. Um, so maybe it's more personal to you. Like, how do you, how do you personally um, manage all of these things? Well, I just want to cite Bell Hooks again because she did say uh, that this kind of work can be toxic to the spirit, um, and I just try to take breaks, um, focus on my kids, <laughs> you know, um, do things that. Uh, recharge me, bake, do things that are unrelated with design so that I can have the energy to do the kind of work that really matters to me. And then another thing is, like, I know I'm a tenure track professor, but really, to me, it's like, what is the kind of work that I really want to be doing? And it feels like, I just have no choice but to do it in some ways, you know, like it's like I'm not, you know, I'm not doing this to check a box. I'm actually doing this because every single one of these projects are really meaningful to me. Um, 
And I do think that impact can be small. Sometimes it's just at an individual level with one person. It doesn't have to be societal. Um, and looking into our communities and how we can do, you know, um, work with our communities uh, that responds to uh, real needs, uh, not, not just parachuting in them, um, to me is also really meaningful. Um, I, I really think that design for social justice can only happen if you're grounded in what's needed and only people can tell you what's actually needed. Um, but yeah, I just try to take breaks so that I don't burn out. Not to say that being a mom is not, is a break, you know? It's like a lot of invisible labor. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, very well said. Thank you for sharing that. Um, <laughs> yeah, impact can be small. Uh, and yeah, I think that the last thing that I haven't really heard much, you know, about social justice, because sometimes it all can also be biased towards the lens of, you know, we're trying to save people, uh, when in reality, what you said, it's important. Like you have to be grounded on what's needed and, and read about the things that you're actually going to be part of. Um, so uh, do you have any questions, Lynn, before we move on? I don't see anything on the chats yet or the Q&A. Um, I know people can be a little bit shy when it, when it comes to the, the, this kind of topics that are kind of be a little bit heavy, but... Um, <laughs> yes, heavy is the word. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm just digesting and just thinking about all these questions that are just really large and looming, and there's, there's just so much um, work that needs to constantly be done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also have a question since no one's asking. Um, it's 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 part of a comment, uh, but this idea that uh, that bell hooks had that you you said it very very clearly how the classroom is like one of the most radical spaces in which you know education and discourse can happen, and a lot of that has to do with the interaction between the instructor and and the students being open to receiving and challenging and having a conversation. So that with this idea of hell of departures, as in sometimes even though the classroom is a very radical space, classroom within a specific context can also be um, censored. So I like I just just a little bit about you just spoke about how hell of departures started, how it's an avenue to to bring in things that you can perhaps you're not allowed to say in certain places. Um, but I I guess yeah, is there anything you want to add that you didn't get a chance to add because I. I feel like that idea is also very powerful. I just wanted to make sure people understand uh, that, you know, like sometimes we people are censored in certain ways, but there's always a way for you to like do things. And unfortunately, it seems that it has to do with personal initiatives or things that are outside of uh, the current spaces that we perhaps went through at some point, which is institutionalized, institutionalized education. Um, I think within institutions, like, 90% of the work that I do is just navigating how institutions work, uh, which is not something that I show in these slides. You know, um, a lot of it is a lot of emails back and forth, you know, trying to figure out how to make something done. Um, but um, I guess, like you said, there is always a way to do something. And I tend to be a dreamer, you know, um, and idealist in many ways. Um, I'm just against all systems of oppression. Um, and I really believe that, you know, there is a way to navigate institutions to do good work. It's not easy and you need to just hold on, you know, uh, but it is possible. Um, I see Lisa um, asked, how do you go about creating community partnerships in a place you are new to? That's a really good question. Um, need to spend some time in that place <laughs> before <laughs> these partnerships. Um, yeah, it took me, it took me about a year to actually do the kind projects and uh, the kind project. It was my first year at the University of Arkansas and um, it took me a while to just like observe what's happening and 
try to meet people, go to local events, um, you know, get to uh, know who's doing what um, and be consistent and um, develop relationships and maintain these relationships um, and just being genuine in the space and opening ears and listening, you know, to what people are saying, um, what they want to change, what they want to be done. Um, and I don't know, it's also about being generous. Like um, a few days ago, so, okay, during my birthday, this is this is uh, a wish that I had this year. I asked people to, instead of giving me a gift, to give me, um, you know, any money that they want so that I could buy uh, books on, uh, written by uh, people of color. Um, and I donated them to uh, a high school here uh, that is uh, centering um, while well, we, uh, my lamp just died and uh, <laughs> started again. But anyways, uh, the, uh, the the high school really works with people of color and people with a low income and these books are so meaningful to me because they really help me navigate life and so i donated them to this high school and um the the principal told me uh this is fantastic. Let's do something together. Uh let's meet again and you know this started a new collaboration with that high school and it and it's just you know like reaching out going there putting yourself out there uh, doing something that is genuine I didn't expect that to come from the principal really to be honest it was just um like I didn't expect anything in return I just wanted to give books he wanted to take a photo of me I was like I don't want any advertising <laughs> um but then it led to something else. And I think a lot of uh, community partnerships are about reaching out sometimes um, to people like out of the blue and being generous. I hope this was a really long answer <laughs> to your question. <laughs> there are many ways. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dina. And thank you so much, Lisa, for your question. That's amazing. And also I see that Karen um, has dropped an amazing link with Verso Books, which is I highly recommend as well. And I have I have a question, mm -hmm. um, which is often as an educator, uh, it when 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 we're doing projects and I have students who want to be doing socially uh, you know, driven work. Um, that people, I think, uh, when they're starting out, feel paralyzed about where to start because it seems like often there's a lot of problems. Like some problems seem too big to tackle. Some problems maybe seem in maybe a little too ins insignificant to, for like a student to like you know dive into. I mean, no problem is really insignificant, but I'm just saying like some people, like uh, students, I feel like feel like, oh, can I really spend my time on this cause when it seems like this is like a bigger problem or more people are talking about it. Like there's a lot of conversation about how do you prioritize the causes while also at the same time, as you talked about, like um, having grace for yourself and doing all the other things that you are required to do in life, just as like a person to take care of yourself. Like, do you have any advice for anyone who's starting out and trying to do all these amazing initiatives? That's a great question too. Um, I think, one of the things that I remind my students is to create possibilities rather than solutions or think about solutions. Like we're not saving the world here, but we're co-creating possibilities, you know? And sometimes these possibilities can have a really small impact, but that impact is nonetheless significant. So sometimes when it's like climate change, you know? not one person is going to solve it and the idea is that we're all creating small possibilities that make up a big thing you know um so i try or i tend to ask them to just focus on their communities focus on you know like their direct things that impact them everyday life uh, without you know um 
without feeling too overwhelmed about what it could be, you know, in a worldwide level. Um, so that's part of it, um, I think. I don't know if I actually responded correctly to this uh, question, but really it's just about, to me, it's just about what can you do with your direct community um, without dreaming of an entire world impact? I mean, the, the, the viral campaigns that I talked about, I didn't think they would go viral, you know? It was just like, let's put something out there and see what happens. Um, and then some of the things go viral and some don't, and some have a small impact and some have a bigger impact. But really like it's it's a collaborative work to create more equitable futures. We can't do it alone. And also sometimes design doesn't have to, you know, create possibilities. Sometimes you just want to design a typeface for the funsies, you know? <laughs> and that's and that's valid too. <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing that. I feel like you know it's it's always hard to answer that question when students or people we know of are asking you know what what do I do how do I do it how do I start. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing this. Uh, sharing what with do us you here. think actually? <laughs> Me, okay. I, I don't know. I, I totally agree with you. I think I think it it really has to be born out of the the person's like deep interest and sort of like um, empathy. And sometimes generally that happens to people who have had been discriminated or have, you know, have been marginalized somehow. And and that ends up being like the, the light that starts the fire towards uh, a, a deeper dive into like, why are these things happening? Why is there so much inequality? Um, so sometimes that all can also lead for people's lack of empathy if they never experienced before. But I generally try to like, bring that to the surface and and let people investigate it in their own way because it needs to be like really um part of that person's uh lived experience sometimes to be able to like really commit and not just be like a tourist like mm -hmm. i'm just going to support this because it's the trendy thing right now and well that kind of support can sometimes be helpful in bringing in numbers i think the deeper work is the, the work that really comes from one person and stays as a, as a long life a long like long long lived uh um, kind of like thing right it, it's it's just part of who you are yeah um but i do have a question actually yeah <laughs> um, because i think the, the last part you just showed with like students kind of like reviving typefaces and bringing this back to um, maybe a little bit of practicality but the statement that they said you know i exist in the future um mm -hmm. i i really resonated with that because it signals to me um and i'm this is what i'm reading into it is that in the past we did not exist which is not true, right? It's just the, the way things are signaling to us, the absence of our histories and our people and people that look like us, or even just the ideas that we've grown up with are not part of the conversations that we are being taught, um, make us feel that like we don't exist. So with this idea of like, I exist in the future, just tying it to, I guess you mentioned the design history retreat, uh, seems like another way of maybe, you know, kind of like expanding and like what Ramote had to say is puncturing, um, Yes. We seem to like in, in putting things in the past, kind of like making a statement that we were part of it. But I'm curious about how you're thinking about this retreat and, you know, what are the plans for it? How far are you? Um, yeah, I just want to hear more about it. Uh, give you time maybe to plug something you're working on, but um, it seems very interesting yeah. to me. So go ahead. So actually, you mentioned that Ramon and Ramon is part of this thing. <laughs> um, so I'm inviting uh, Ramon Tejada, uh, Tashika Arsuno Sutorn, and uh, Briar Levitt, and also uh, Lisa Mayoni um, to Hello Departures. And we're going to get together and with some of the grads and local faculty, we just want to create a framework, I guess that's like my ideal scenario, our ideal scenario, like create a framework that anybody could use uh, in their local context to teach design history from a decolonial perspective. And the idea is not to have something that is universal whatsoever. It's more, how can we teach design histories using the local context from a decolonial perspective? Um, and, you know, there are a series of workshops uh, 
that that are planned uh, where we can co-create this. And really it's just an intensive three days where we're asking these questions and trying to uh, answer them. And then there will be, um, I think two open sessions where people can join us and also join the conversation. Um, and I guess part of it is also how to engage uh, with um, the, the Snap Snap Sizzle library and archive that we have. How can we include some of that content, you know, in uh, this um framework? And I don't necessarily want to use the word curriculum just because. Again, like I feel like a curriculum wants to be universal, whether whereas um, design history cannot be taught from a universal perspective at all, you know. And we see, like, we've seen the limits of this, and we still see it. And then, you know, I think this comes after I taught that course, and I was like, shit, I wish I actually had a way more resources to teach this course. And really, it was just like pulling things here and there, you know, um, to make a course that was not just full of white guys. Um, and um, after that, I had a couple of colleagues who were teaching design histories and knew I taught design histories from that perspective who asked me for uh, my syllabus and what I did. And so I shared that with them. And so there is a real need, you know, uh, to to. Um, teach design histories from a decolonial perspective, but also not knowing where to start. And I think as educators and designers and people who are interested in design, we just need to get together and actually make it happen instead of doing it separately in our own bubbles, you know? So that's one of the goals. It's again, it's a very idealist dream. <laughs> No, I, I love it. It's the positivity that keeps us going, right? I mean, like, there's a lot of things in the world that need to be fixed. But if it's all doom and gloom, um, it's hard to keep yourself motivated, because, you know, we all want a better future for those around us, for ourselves, our loved ones, you know, all these things. So I just love your positivity, Dina, <laughs> even as like, you're doing all this you know, work that I know must be terribly hard to keep on going on a day-to-day -day basis. Like I have no doubt that it's so much work along with everything else that you have going on, your family, your job, like every, like your students, like everything, right? Um, so much admiration and just thank you so much for keep like reminding us that like it's one step at a time, like, and mm -hmm. we all work together. I mean, there's a lot of thoughts that are going on. It's probably used to marinate. Um, we are at the top of the hour, though, and I wanted to be conscientious of everybody's time. And maybe as one last uh, closing question, is there anything that you want to um, plug or remind everyone of um, before before we all go and think about of all these things? <laughs> But that nothing is neutral. Um, nothing is neutral in anything. And um, that also um, pertains to silence. Silence is not neutral. So just speak up for the things that matter to you um, and that can make this planet a better place to live in. Cheers. Thank you so much. 100%. Thank you so much, Dina. Thank you for everybody who actually attended this talk. I really appreciate it. And um, just reach out to me as well if you know you want to continue this conversation. I'm very much open to it. And thank you, Juan and Lynn, for having me. It was so nice to have a conversation. I didn't want to take the whole hour to have a talk. You know, I actually wanted to have a conversation. Um, so I'm grateful you allowed me to do so. Thank you so much. Like thank you, Dina. Thank you for coming. We're just so honored that you you're here. You gave us so many things to talk about and shared all your hard-earned knowledge and you know insights. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you everyone for coming. Hey. Have a great uh Bye. yeah, morning, afternoon, <laughs> evening, wherever you are. <laughs> all righty, with much love. We will see you all. Bye y'all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.